Leonardo was a genius. He was also not very well organized. He was kind of a perfectionist. He never finished anything. He had the Mona Lisa with him at the very end of his life. He'd been working on it for 20 years and he would sort of like every few days go over and add a little bit to it. So throughout his notebooks, there's many very charming passages that say things like, I ought to write a book about this mechanical stuff I've been doing all these gears. I ought to write a book about all the, all the, all the beautiful internal organs I've dissected from people and animals. I ought to write a book about how birds fly. And he didn't do any of that. But fortunately, what he did do was he kept copious notes of all sorts of things. And when he died, he left about 4,000 pages of stuff, not very well organized, in a big case. And then a century goes by and some of the notebooks go over here and some of the notebooks go up to Germany and some go to England. So how confident are we that what we see in, these, in the codices is what Leonardo might have intended? Are they, are they in fact in any kind of order at all? Are they chronological, for example? So how might we go about looking at this? Well, art historians and conservatives have been very interested in this question for a long time and they've thought about it deeply. And they've come up with a lot of ideas and all based on essentially the content of the pages, looking at what, what's written on the pages. I mean, that makes a lot of sense. We're looking here at uh, complementary information. We're gonna look at the structure of the paper and see if there's anything that can be learned from this. So what, do, what does paper look like? Well, okay, in, in historical paper from about the 1850s back was all made the same way. You have this, uh, okay, they're about this big, it's a wooden frame, it's a sieve. You see there's a bunch of vertical lines about an inch apart here, lots of horizontal lines. And what you do is you dip that sieve into a vat of paper slurry, okay, rags, pulp, water. It's been heated, boiled for a long time. You shake it around a bit, and you, oh yeah. Oh, so that's the sieve. This is the useful part. The, the, the chain lines in the vertical direction, the laid lines in the horizontal direction. And they would often annotate it and, and, and uh, decorate it with something that proved the authenticity of the paper. We are the eagle paper manufacturers, for example. So these are, because of the era, these molds are handmade. So even though they're making them the, the same, um, they're never exactly the same. So maybe we can look inside the pieces of paper and extract information about these three things. So here's uh, page one of the Lester Codex. Um, you, so what you see here is this is, we're looking at the, the page, or the, actually two pages, through uh, trans, with transmitted light held behind it. And there's sort of this outline here buried inside all this uh, stuff, this, you know, the surface features that we want to ignore. And it's a little hard to see. I mean, I, I think if you look at this particular page, you can, you can decide it's an eagle. But some pages are even more difficult to, to see. And wouldn't it be nice if we could somehow do some sort of processing on this to like get rid of all this junk here that's obscuring our view of the watermark? So here's sort of the idea for that little portion of the Le Lester one uh, eagle watermark. So here's the corresponding surface image, just a photograph of that page, uh, the back of the page. Here's the photograph of the front of the page. And so what you see here is a mixture of all the, well, you can kind of see the thing here and there's that line from up that side. Here's that same piece of paper. And what I've done is I've lined the two, well, the three images up perfectly. Those of you who use Mathematica might recognize the image align function. It lets you line up the surface image number one with whatever part of this is represented by surface image number one. It lets you line up surface image number two with the second part of whatever's there. And then we're just gonna do a weighted average of these things. So if you look at my code here, M is the transmitted light image, A is one side, B is the other side, and I'm gonna control the two numbers by moving the slider. Ooh, ooh, 
Ooh, isn't that wonderful? Now you can't always get everything out, right? I mean, you look down here, you see this sort of little embossing effect or something. That's, that's some, some sort of leftover effect that's not quite matched up. So this, to do this, the alignment has to be really precise. You have to have sub-pixel registration, better than single pixel registration. And fortunately, by playing with the various options in image align, and you, can, you, can, you can do this alignment pretty reliably throughout the, the various codices. Here's three examples. You see two eagles, one upside down. And that one, if you look at it, if you don't look below for a second, if you look at the one on the right there, is that an eagle? And, and, one, and remember what we're trying to do. We're trying to look for exactness of representation between two separate pages. Um, if you can't see the thing really clearly, you're never going to be able to make such a determination. So the denoising step is, is, is a key piece of this puzzle. So what do we do with this once we've got them denoised? Well, we code them. Okay. Um, and so basically what we do is we go into the watermark and we pick a bunch of points that we think are really significant points for this watermark. So here's for this eagle, for instance, you know, we do from the tip of the wing to the tip of the wing. We do from the top of the wing to the top of the wing. Maybe you do from where this, uh, where this vertical chain line here intersects the top of the crown. Anyway, you choose some points and then that gives you a code. If you, we actually code it by looking at the ratios because the photographs are not always taken at the same scale. They're not always taken at the same distance, especially when you take photographs of one codex and compare them to photographs of another codex, everything's different in terms of the photographic technique. Um, but these numbers are pretty invariant. It takes a few minutes to do, but you know, there's 46 or so uh, different watermarks in the thing. So if it takes you five minutes a piece, that's a lot less time than it takes you to do anything else. So here's uh, an example of three different sets of Eagle watermarks from the Arendelle uh, Codex. And you see the blue ones, there's there are two of them. <laughs> They're pretty much the same thing. You see there's the orange ones, there's four of them. Pretty much the same thing. And then that black one there, uh, 208, those are the page numbers, 208, 209. Um, is all by itself. It's not the same as any of the others. So right away, we've, 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 we can say without a doubt, the, the orange ones are different from the ones coded blue and different from the, from the other one. So this greatly reduces our sort of search space. And you can formalize this kind of thing by comparing one, this compares this particular one to what we called, okay, we named them group A, B, C, D for these four particular watermarks. So these are all eagles, A, B, C, D, and it shows you that the distance between the current one we're measuring and the others look like that. So that tells us with some degree of assurance, well, it indicates that we really ought to look carefully <laughs> at those pages that come in groups. So here, here's a place, if, if, if this stuff interests you, We've, 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 we've created this website called Leo Code because we're coding up the codices of, of Leonardo. And if you go to this website, um, you can see it's leocode.org. And what you see is, well, here's, here's all the information we have so far about the, the Arendelle and the, and the Leicester Codex. We'll be putting up the Madrid information as soon as we get permission to do so. Um, what you're seeing here in, 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 in this video here is we are essentially morphing between Arendelle 6667 and this is what we call an overlay video. It's, it's somehow, ah, there we are. And, and what we've done is to essentially overlay the denoised images right on top of each other. And if it's a little hard to see, but if you look at these, you can see they, there's no place where the, the, they actually differ. You know, watch the tip of the tip of the wing, watch the claw, watch the nose of the eagle, watch the, there's three little spikes on the eagle's head. And so these overlay videos, overlay animations are, are what we show to the art historians and the conservators to, to make the argument that this is really the same. They're not impressed by graphs with orange and blue lines in them. Uh, oh, and there's a bunch more stuff here. If you want to, so our, our software is um, here. So software overview. Here you can see all the programs that we have 
uh, created to do this. Mo uh, essentially, all of them are, all these software modules are written in Mathematica. If it's really true that the watermarks are from the exact same physical mold, then not only must the watermarks be the same, but the chain lines have to be the same. Not only must the chain lines be the same, but the laid lines have to be the same. Now, okay, unfortunately, in many of the, uh, in, in many of the Lester pages, the laid lines are not visible enough to actually get any decent measurements on. So a third of our potential evidence is gone. Here's an outline of, of the a program that we developed to extract the chain lines. Um, it basically, okay, look at these, look at these wonderful mathematical functions, radon transform. It gives you a little picture that you can then process a little bit, and it tells you how to, how to straighten the thing up and down. Once it's straightened, you filter it with a large vertical filter, and then you do, this is, this is image lines. A wonderful, another wonderful thing, which, what does it do? It picks out the lines. Okay, great, thank you, image lines. And then once you know what the lines are, you can do that same kind of coding thing we did. You look at the ratios between all the successive, successive lines, and that gives you a, a, a set of features that you can then match numerically. We also have a little interface when, when the, the previous thing fails, and you can just go in and mark it yourself. You can say, oh, look, here's, I put, I put these little red plus signs down where, where the chain lines are, and then it automatically calculates the codes, which look something like this. And we've essentially represented the ratios of the two, uh, of the uh, successive, successive lines in a code like, in a chart like this. And you can see that, well, these, these particular six happen to group into those two. And then you make sure that the grouping you have from the watermarks is the same as the grouping from the chain lines. Laid lines. These are the really dense ones that were that that are uh, the, the 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 small ones. Okay, here's a little. I can see the magnifying glass. A little blow up of it. You can see two chain lines in the vertical direction and a whole bunch of laid lines in this direction. You can't count that by hand by eye. I mean, there's just too many of them. Makes it a perfect application for Fourier transforms. You're looking for sort of a, something that's mostly a repetitive thing. And indeed, if you think of any vertical slice on that, well, down, the, down that page, um, then it's, it's, a, it's basically an undulating thing, not exact, not really sinusoidal. Um, if, you look at the, if you look at one of the spectra, you'll see well, it's got a sort of fundamental frequency, which corresponds nicely typically to the, what you see when you look at that thing. And then it's got a whole bunch of harmonics that represent something like the shape of the, 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 the actual wires that are that are represented here that you can see. Um, there's some technical details of how you do this calculation to get sufficient resolution. Um, there's this thing called the phase vocoder that allows you to combine measurements from multiple overlapping FFTs to refine the frequency estimation. So we actually do that because otherwise it's a little bit coarse. In any case, once you make the frequency estimation, you end up with something that looks like this. So here it's simply color coded. Um, you know, red means the lines are close together. Blue means the lines are relatively far apart in that piece of the in that piece of the paper. So this represents this whole piece of paper here. And so, what does this look like when it comes down to? Oh yeah. So here's the kind of thing you have. Say there's four four candidates here. Is there a match? Is there not a match? I think you can kind of see that the, the second one actually looks pretty good, huh? You might want to come up with some sort of numerical, mathematical way of describing sort of the difference between these pictures. Um, and then using all this information, you can build what's called a collation diagram. And this is for the Arendelle, this is for the Lester Codex. And these are how the pages are, um, uh, are, are aligned. So, th so that's really what I wanted to say. We, we're currently working on the Madrid Codex. Madrid has about uh, 30 watermarks that look like what are called bull's heads and uh, only a couple of anything else. So we don't have, so one thing that was fascinating about the Arendelle and the Lester is that there were, a couple, there were two watermarks which are identical in the different codices. Does that mean anything? I don't know. 
I mean, it means that someone really needs to take a look at it closely, I think, because I don't think that computer scientists are the right people to be making those decisions.